Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. For the manner in which the whale has evolved is among the finest exemplars of the changes evolution can bring to bear upon life on Earth. With me to discuss the evolutionary history of the whale are Eleanor Weston, a mammalian paleontologist at the Natural History Museum in London, Bill Amos, Professor of Evolutionary Genetics at Cambridge University, and Steve Jones, Professor of Genetics at University College London. Steve Jones, can you give us some context for the beginnings of what turned into the whale? I think the whale as well as being a sort of a magnificent creature and meta- almost, a, almost a swimming metaphor, as Herman Melville uses him, uh, is a classic example of what might happen to humans if we landed on a new planet. Because the whales were the first mammals really to go into the sea. And the sea was then, um, 65 million years ago or a bit, er- a bit earlier than that, the sea was then more or less empty. It had been pulsing with life. But with the death of the dinosaurs um, at that time, many of the giant predatory lizards that were in the sea had disappeared. So there was an empty world waiting to be um, experienced. And then you can really almost see step by step now um, in this new world which they'd entered, there was endless uh, ecological niches, as we would say, were available, endless new ways of life, and they very, very rapidly took advantage of those and de- developed into enormous creatures, into creatures of medium size, into rather small creatures. There's a rather interesting uh, new piece of information which shows how astonishing the whale actually is. I'm, I'm sure most people listening to this program have heard about the amazingly well-preserved early primate of 47 million years ago that turned up two or three days ago. And looking at that fossil uh, tells us how boring our own evolution has been compared to that of the whale. Because when that primate was uh, was hanging around, um, what the ancestors of whales were like were actually land animals, more or less, or land animals that occasionally went into the sea. But and we knew almost nothing then, 40 years ago, about their fossil record. We knew absolutely nothing about their molecular genetics, about their DNA. And in just half a century or so of research, they've changed from a complete evolutionary enigma to perhaps the most perfect example of Darwin's theory as illustrated by fossils, by genes, and by the behaviour of living creatures that we possess. David, about the fossil evidence available? I think the the fossil evidence is particularly impressive, and it's also particularly emblematic, because some of the earliest fossils of whales were found not on the seashore, but high up in the Himalayas. And when you think about it, that's completely startling. It is, in fact, the case that the summit of Everest, not very long ago, was actually at the bottom of the deep ocean. And uh, the reason why Everest is so tall, of course, is because we now know, as Darwin didn't, that there are plates across the world which are crashing into each other, and there there are oceans which have appeared and disappeared sometimes more than once. And the first whale called Pakicetus was found in Pakistan, in the mountains of Pakistan. Um, uh, It dates from something, something like 50 million or a bit more years ago. Ambulocetus. Yes, well, Ambulocetus, if you like, might be one step on from the very earliest um, whale, which you mentioned there, Pachycetus. And that was because it was clearly um, amphibious. In fact, it's been referred to as the walking whale because it had four limbs that clearly could support itself on land. In other words, the, the legs were still attached to the backbone. But there was clear evidence that this animal lived in water. and What is the clear evidence? Well, for instance, an extraordinary development of the foot was that it was extremely long and broadened, so it actually acted a bit like a paddle. But, but the paddle was really just in the hind legs, so I suppose this animal was more like an otter when you think about how they use their, their hind legs. But also the backbone was very flexible. There's evidence that it was already moving up and down like modern whales you know that they have a very distinctive way of swimming where the the tail with the tail fluke that goes up and down which is different to fish so that was also some traces of that were in this early amphibious um whale and but we we do still have evidence that it would have probably come out on land to um maybe feed that's slightly controversial but perhaps give birth and, and yet it's found, geologically speaking, in sediments that are indeed marine. So Ambulocetus was one step on from the earliest whales, which we actually do find both in freshwater 
the fossils are found in freshwater sediments and marine sediments. So we're, we're seeing some transition, if you like, into um, life in water. Basilosaurus was um, about 10 million years later. They found these spectacular articular skeletons of what you might call a sea serpent. You know, initially, that, that's what so they looked like. So about 38, 39 million years yes, ago. So, that's uh, fine, yeah. um, yes, yeah. And they were clearly marine animals, almost, almost, I mean, fully adapted to life in water. And they, they would have had a, a, what we could believe is a tail fluke and moved around. But what was striking about them is they still had legs, very small legs that were detached from the backbone that were, if you like, vestigial, but they had still some evidence that they functioned. You know, there was a locking knee and, and muscle attachments. And they've actually thought, well, these legs clearly couldn't have supported the animal on land. So perhaps they were used to assist with something like copulation or... or but but I suppose what's interesting is you have this remnant There's of... There's guiding factors in the copulation. Yes, yes, yeah. Right. But you have, and it's an external leg, whereas I think today in modern whales, internally, we have a remnant of evidence to suggest that, that they had legs. But now, about 30 million years ago, as I understand it, they became fully aquatic. Can you tell us how that happened and what, what the whale had to do in order to enable that to happen? Well, I think Ellen has already described a really fully aquatic form. When your back legs are only 18 inches long and your body's 40 foot long, you're going to struggle to do much on land at all. Um, and they're already developing flipper-like forelimbs, fall which are necessary for swimming. Um, I think how much I mean, indeed, you're developing flipper-like forelimbs from legs. How long does it take? The evidence seems to suggest that all this happened incredibly quickly. Yeah, but incredibly quickly for you. Is, uh, incredibly uh, quickly would of be us. of the order of one, two, three million years. I think once you, as it were, dip, you, you, you remove yourself from the land to the point where you're spending your entire life at sea, which is the main transition which, for example, seals have failed to do. Seals still have to come ashore to breed, whereas the whales can give birth in the water. As soon as you do that, you lose the necessity for retaining your land locomotion and you can go from, instead of having four limbs which would have supported your weight and helped you sort of move around like seals do, you can have them as proper flippers and you can go over much more to the fish-like form um, and be able to be much more efficient when you're swimming. Um, they didn't evolve gills. Why do you think that? This is, well... Didn't happen. <laughs> Basically, you can think of evolution as, as, as driving change along a progressive series of steps. And um, you can have, as it were, what we call adaptive peaks. The, these are states which are clearly nicely formed um, and, and they work really nicely. Now, then, if you want to breathe underwater, there are two, two ways of doing it, really. One is that you can take oxygen from the water and you can use gills, as fishes do. And the other is you can retain... Um, lungs and process air which ties you to the surface but it's such a completely different mechanism and you evolution needs intermediary steps it can't just suddenly flip from lungs to gills so in order to get from one to the other um, would require you in some way releasing your need to go and fill your lungs with air and at the same time with a high metabolism and a high oxygen requirement swap your mechanism over and that to me is pretty much completely implausible I mean, evolution is really, a, uh, natural selection, is really nothing more than a series of successful mistakes. And you're basically, uh, you know, every animal is, living, is a living fossil of all its ancestors. And it's very hard to get from the summit of Everest to the summit of Kanchenjunga, which are two excellent places to be, without down, going down the valley in between them. And evolution has never managed to make the journey. It's obvious. Right. Hippopotami. It isn't all that obvious to well, us. It kind of is. I mean, so. Hippopotami. So can you just tell us how obvious it is? Well, hippopotam hippopotami live spend a lot of their time in water. Okay, they don't have like whales, um, like an uh, like an early ancestor of a whale. Um, they don't have any hair like whales. They keep their testicles in a convenient bag outside the body. They, so they keep it unlike ourselves, who keeps their testicles in a convenient bag outside the body. <laughs> their testicles are internal, like whale testicles are. They communicate underwater hippopotami by squeaking and squealing, just like whales do. So you can, you know, once you've got the clue, it all begins to fit together. Thanks, uh, Bill Amos, uh, Eleanor Wesson, and Steve Jones. Next week...